Today we live in an American Idol society where we judge others by their skills, talents, and giftings. In doing so, we compare ourselves to others and think that God could never use us. There's a saying that goes, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies those whom he calls. Throughout the Bible, we read of the average common people whom God used in miraculous ways. Today, not only is God still calling the average, the common, and the less qualified, he's calling us to show forth his marvelous power, his wisdom, and his unyielding love to a world that worships idols. Let's prepare our hearts as Terry shares how God wants to equip us with the it, the it that will mightily be used in our lives. Today's message is entitled, All God Needs is a Stick. Let's now join Terry in the sanctuary. Well, good morning. How are you? I need a little volume from you guys today. Can I have a little volume? Say hallelujah. hallelujah. That's what I want to hear. Praise the Lord. Uh, today, we're going to take a step again, something entirely different. Um, some things have been happening uh, around the, uh, the church. Man, we've had a busy, we've had a busy, busy year so far. I realize that, and I apologize for that. But I believe uh, we're making an impact on the city. And we just did our uh, marriage retreat banquet, and we have 11 different small groups that are happening around the city within this church and within uh, several other churches as well. And uh, people came to the dinner. They enjoyed it. They signed up and for the various different small groups. And so marriages are going to be touched. Marriages are going to be touched. And by the way, uh, when marriages are touched, guess what else has changed? Families. And when families are changed, guess what else has changed? Culture. Amen? And that's what the church is all about. The church is all about change for the kingdom of God. And that's what we should be very busy about, and that's what we've been doing. So if you still would like to sign up for that, there are a couple more spots to sign up. I encourage you to, we, I think, are they on the Welcome Center, babe? Um, babe means my wife, okay? So <laughs> right there, because I, I noticed Richard was ready to answer me. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> you can still sign up for that. And so I encourage you to do that. But yeah, it's a great time, and we really want to see a difference in this city. But Throughout this week, throughout this month, actually, uh, there's been a lot of uh, attacks of the enemy upon people's lives. And I know it and I recognize it. Why? Because we've been studying the, the things that uh, the enemy does. And so we recognize that the enemy hates the fact that a church and the churches want to advance the kingdom of God. So he will put up a fight. Expect it. In anticipate it. Be glad for it. That means we are making a dent in the, in the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light. So here's what I want you guys to do to say, I want you to do today. I want you to repeat after me. God, God use, use me. me. Say it again. One, two, three. God, God use me. me. Remember that. Remember what you said there. This is like, just like I just all of a sudden I tricked you and signed you guys up for the military or something, right? <laughs> but God, use me. Those are the words I want you guys to remember. I want to read you a story, and this is a story of Moses. Remember Moses? He's the guy that um, uh, they told him to kill all the children, but uh, his mother hid him in a basket in the river, and he was saved, and then Pharaoh's wife, Pharaoh's daughter, I guess it was, saw the baby. Was it wife or daughter? This really rich woman saw this baby in the water, and uh, she says she rescued it. And she gave it, now look, this is the interesting part most people don't think. They think that all of a sudden they just took Moses in and brought it into her house. But no, she gave Moses back to her mother, says, you take care of him until of a certain age, and then he'll come into the family of Pharaoh. So during that time, can you imagine his mother, hallelujah, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, God. You rescued my baby when all the others have died. You have a plan and purpose for this baby right here. And so can you imagine when she's raising this baby, Moses, that she was explaining to him, you have been saved for a purpose. And your people, God's going to use you to rescue his people who are enslaved here to all the Egyptians. God's going to use you. So Moses grew up underneath her teaching. Then he goes into Pharaoh's house, and he grows up underneath the teaching of Pharaoh. But there's something about Moses I noticed. I, I believe with all my heart that he knew what, uh, what he was supposed to do. And so what he did is uh, one day he was uh, watching the, the Egyptians uh, beat the slaves, just beat the slaves and stuff, you know, and his heart went out to it. One day, Moses was out, and he saw two of the Hebrew men, Hebrew men, the slaves, they were fighting, and they were bickering. And so, uh, well, well I, I got ahead of myself. I got ahead of myself. 
One of the Egyptians was beating the Hebrew men. And this really grieved Moses' heart. So he grabbed, he looked, the Bible says he looked this way and he looked that way. He knew what he was doing. He went over and he grabbed the guy and he killed him. Then he went and buried him in the sand. And he thought, that's the end of that. I rescued, God's got me to rescue my people. This is how I'm supposed to do it. I want to kill some of these guys. And so he goes back home. The next day or sometime after that, then he came across two Hebrew uh, slaves that were bickering and fighting, going back and forth. And he says, man, you guys ought not do this. This is wrong. And one of them, with an attitude, turned to him and goes, oh, really? Well, what are you going to do? You're going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian and buried him in the sand? <gasps> Moses was freaked out. Pharaoh got wind of this. And Pharaoh says, bring that boy to me. We're going to kill him. Moses took off and fled into the wilderness. And he stayed out there and he hid out there for a long time. And while he was out there, I mean, it's been 40 years. And while he was out there, he took on the job of a, a shepherd. Hey, Lyndall, don't let me forget. You're going to speak right afterwards. I had something, okay? That's between her and me because I, I forgot. Okay, here we go. But anyway, Moses was out there taking care of the sheep. And all of a sudden, he saw this burning bush caught his eye. He went to check it out, but it was not being consumed. It was not being consumed like uh, uh, the uh, metal scrapyard out here. It was just burning and it was just right there. And so he went and looked on it and all of a sudden he heard the voice of God speaking to him. And, uh, and God speaks to him. He says, I'm going to send you to rescue my people. But Moses had all kinds of excuses. Not me. Not me. I just ran from them. I, they have posters of me everywhere, okay? They're in the mail rooms everywhere. They're, they're going to find me and they will kill me. God, don't send me there. Besides, I, I, I'm not very good at this kind of stuff. I can't lead people. They won't believe me. And right here, we're going to pick up in Exodus 4, verses 1 through 4, and it says this. Then Moses answered and said, and he's speaking to God in the bush, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to Moses, what's that in your hand? And he said, a rod, because he was a shepherd. He had a stick in his hand. And he said, and God said, cast it down on the ground. So Moses cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. I love that part. How many of you guys would flee if you threw a stick down and it turned into a snake? Some of you might be going like that, but this guy took off and ran. And so Moses fled from it. And the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it. And it became a rod again in his hand. Hallelujah. You know, at that moment, all the thing that he had in, in his possession on him at that time, it was a rod and his sandals. And one of the things that God did tell him, he says, take off your sandals. He goes, because you're on holy ground. But I also think that God told him to take off your sandals because I want you to stop running from your calling that I have upon your life. Stop running, Moses. Stop running. But Moses was full of fear. For 40 years, he was running from his calling. He knew his calling because his mother told him all about it. And he was running from his calling because he made a mistake. How many of you guys have ever wanted to do something for the Lord, you made a mistake, and you feel like God can't use me anymore? And so you just don't pursue that. You kind of run from it. You kind of hide from it. This message is for you today because God has a calling on all of our lives. That's why your heart is beating. Amen? Hallelujah. So he ran and hid in the desert. Even though God has raised him to be delivered, he was hiding. And God speaks to Moses in a burning bush. And Moses was equipped with just a stick and the sandals. And um, you and I have a calling in our lives. We have a God's will on our lives. And God wants to do something with us in our lives. He wants to do it in the world that we're living today. That's why you're living today, church. That's not why you weren't living back in Moses' day. Because he has a purpose for you today. Please know this. You may feel like I'm nothing, I'm nobody. That's exactly how Moses felt about this as well. Moses gave God every kind of excuse. I mean, he was afraid. Listen to this. Before God can use you, usually you're going to have to face those fears that hold you and bind you. God's going to use you, and he's going to place you in a position where you're going to have to face those fears. Maybe it's a fear in, in a relationship. Maybe it's a fear of speaking to people. Maybe it's a fear that you have to go back and take care of something before you can go any further. Lord, I can't go back there. I can't talk to them again. God says, no, we're going to deal with this fear, and you're going to be an overcomer. And that's exactly what Moses did. He had fear in his life, but he was an overcomer. That didn't mean the fear was gone, church. Listen to me. The fear was still there, but he overcame it and did what God called him to do, and he faced that fear. And so when he threw the stick, uh, the stick on the ground, 
it became supernatural. Think about that. That's not natural, amen? It's not natural to throw sticks on the ground for them to turn to snakes. This was something supernatural, sensational. And God, God wants to use just the stick. That's, that's the picture that you saw the dog. God sometimes just wants to use the sticks in our lives. Don't think it has to be something great. See, we live in a culture today, it's called the American idol culture, where we worship the people who have the talents. We worship the people with the skills and the people with the brains. We worship the people who are very good at speaking, whatever it may be. We, we worship the beautiful people. We worship all these and we put them way up there. And we feel that we can never attain that and so therefore, if we can't attain that, we can't do what we're called to do. God's calling sticks today. He didn't ask for Moses' brains. He didn't ask for those things. He says, give me what you got. Give me the stick. Give me a simple stick that's right there in your hand. If it's God's going to use you, you're going to have to overcome your fears. But also this, God uses the stick. And what does that represent? Listen to me. That represents the common. That represents the ordinary. And that represents the average. Amen? I want you to know this. God's going to call you. You may feel common. You may feel ordinary. You may feel average. Hallelujah. You are whom God is calling. Moses gave him all kinds of excuses. And God says, you know what? I didn't say I'm looking for excellence in this and excellence in that. If I was, I wouldn't come to you, Moses. I came to you because you're common. I came to you because you're ordinary. I came to you because you're average. And that's who I want to use to set my people free and do miraculous things. Amen? God wants to use the sticks in our lives. The things, again, don't think about, I can't do this, I can't do that. Stop saying that. Amen? I'm here to, I'm here to play mom on you. Stop it. Stop it. Did I do that right, mom? Okay. <laughs> Usually it's followed by a stick. But anyway, stop it. Sometimes we think we have to be super talented. Sometimes we think we have to be very good looking. Sometimes we think we have to be brilliant. We have to be amazing. Again, that's that American Idol. But God is looking for the simple and the ordinary and the common. Go ahead to the next slide there. I want people to see that and I want that to burn in them. God is looking for the simple, the ordinary, and the common. Sometimes God just needs the stick. When Moses was standing at the Red Sea, he held out the, the stick and the waters, they separated, and then they miraculously walked on dry ground and in this deep, deep water. I'm, we're not talking muddy, mucky water, mucky soil. They walked on dry ground, and that wind blew all night. And then when they crossed it, the waters closed in on their enemies and utterly destroyed them. Sometimes God just wants to use a stick in our lives. The tree branch. Remember when the waters at Mira. Uh, when the, uh, the Israelites were out in the wilderness and they came and they was dying of thirst and all of a sudden they saw this water and it was a pool and it was very, very bitter. What did God tell them to do? He took a stick and he threw it in the water and it became sweet. Sometimes God just wants to use a stick in doing what he wants to do. Remember Elisha. He was building a, uh, like a church, a training center for all the prophets and they're out there, they're cutting down the trees, building this cabin. And what happens? Someone brawled an ax and the ax head flew off into the river. And he's, oh my goodness, I, I borrowed that. What am I going to do? So Elijah takes a stick and he stirs it in the water. And what happens? That axe head came and floated to the top and they were able to retrieve it. Sometimes God just wants to use the stick in our lives. God wants to use just the ordinary, the things that just confounds the, why, the wisdom of this world. God wants to use that. Don't fall for the trap. Don't fall for the lie that we have to, have, we have to be this type of person that we see in the world today. God wants to use the common, the ordinary, and the average people in our lives. When God wanted to redeem the world, what did he do? He used two sticks, made a cross, and Jesus died upon that. And now we're redeemed because God used ordinary sticks in this world. So quit saying you're not smart enough. Quit saying that you're not talented enough or you're not eloquent enough. Quit saying you can't do it. Quit saying it's too hard. Quit saying it's too big. Stop it. Because God wants to use you and I, the simple, the ordinary. Amen? Can we say hallelujah for that? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's what God wants to do. All he needs is a stick. Do you know where Moses was where he got that stick? Moses had to go through 
the wilderness. He had to go through some desert times in order to find that stick. Moses picked up the stick when he was in that wilderness for 40 years. That's where he picked up the stick. Sometimes you and I have to go some trials and troubles. We do. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, you will. <laughs> I'm here to say, it's coming, church. If you're not in it now, you may have just come out of it, but it sure is coming for you, amen? No one got excited about that. I understand that. But the truth is this, God promised it. The hard times are coming. The desert times are coming. But I want you to hear this. In order for God to get that stick, Moses had to go through the desert. But I want you to know, God never intends for you to go through difficult times without you picking up something that he can use. You see that? Go to that right there. God never intends for you to go through the hard times and desert times without you picking up something that he can use. So many times we as Christians, as a matter of fact, I, I was on social media and I saw a guy uh, I was friends with a long time ago, and he's a pastor now or maybe associate pastor or youth pastor, and um, he ministers to people. And he was on there talking about how God has deserted him. The spirit of mom came all over me. I wanted to slap him so bad, Okay. The thing is this, God deserted us. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You're going to go through the desert at times. You're going to go through some dry times and dry spells. And when you do, I want you, there's some things in there you're going to pick up. If you just focus instead of focusing on those things. Every single time the Israelites, they went through something difficult, what did they do? They murmured. They complained. They grumbled. Why God? Why God? Oh, why, why? And they're just like that. They're just like a baby. They wouldn't change. And this, this is the thing, if I could say this, if I could speak for God, this drove him crazy. This drove God crazy. And he says, why are you doing this? As a matter of fact, he punished them again and again and again for this type of stuff. They just couldn't get it. Listen, church, you and I are going to go some desert times. You may be in it right now. It may be physical. It may be emotional. It may be financial. I don't know what your, your desert is that you're going through. It, but it's a hard thing. But I want you to know, number one, God is with you. If he is your Lord and your Savior, he goes with you everywhere you go. Hallelujah. And number two, he will see you through that because he has a purpose for you. Like Moses, he wants you to pick up something in your life that he can use in a miraculous way to use you in a miraculous way. Some of you may say, well, I don't want to go through it. I don't want to be used in a miraculous way. And you won't be. Nor will you come out of that desert. So many times, you know, God allowed, how many, how many years did he allow the Israelites to walk around Mount Sinai? A long time. They just would not learn their lesson because they kept grumbling, complaining, and they had to walk around it again and again. You know, they could have been out of that desert like that if they would have just uh, trusted God. Amen? So, what we need to do, God never wants you to go through a desert time complaining and grumbling he wants you to trust him in that time. This is powerful, church. This is powerful. God never intends for you to go through the desert without picking something up in your life. Hallelujah. God wants to equip you with something so that he can use it, use that thing in your life mightily in your life. So Moses and Aaron, they do as God tells them. They go to Pharaoh. They take their stick with them. And by the way, I want you guys to notice something else here. When Moses threw that stick down, God says, throw the stick down. He threw it down. It turned into a snake. It scared him. What did God tell him to do? He says, now pick up that snake. And this is interesting, by the tail. I don't know if this is what God meant to do or not. But I believe, see, I'm not a snake handler. How many snake handlers do we have in here? Oh, we're in the wrong church. Okay, anyway. <laughs> God, when you go to pick up a snake, you pick it up by the, where it's going to bite, you pick it up by the head, don't you? You step on it and you pick it up by the back of the neck. I've caught many of snakes in my life. And you grab it there. You don't grab it by the tail. Why? Because he comes around and goes, what you doing with my tail? And he bites you. He bites you. But God told Moses, you grab it by the tail. And it turned into a rod instantly. What God, I believe, is saying is this. You take care of the small things and I'll take care of the big things. Okay? Listen, church. You, yeah, my wife said that's good. You take care of this. I heard it somewhere. It's not mine. But it's good. It's still good. It needs repeating. Amen? We take care of the small things. God's going to take care of the big things. Hallelujah. I wish there was some life in this church today. <laughs> Moses and Aaron, they go to Pharaoh. And they cast down that. They said, hey, let God's people go. Let them go. They're going to go into the wilderness so they can worship their Lord and their Savior. And they, actually, it was only supposed to be gone for like a week. But 
Pharaoh says, no, I don't know your God. I don't know you. I've got all these gods. I've got all these sorcerers. I've got all these magicians. I don't need you. Who are you to come here and tell me? He says, God has sent me, and here's a sign. Boom, threw the stick down, turned into a snake right away. And so Pharaoh, he had his own magicians, his own uh, uh, sorcerers. They threw their sticks down too. Now, some commentaries, if you read about it, it says they use trickery. You know, they go and all of a sudden they cast some clay and they stick a snake in it and they throw it down and it breaks. I have no idea. Or it could be spiritual because the devil can do miracles as well. Listen to me, listen to me. In the end times, the Bible says the devil's going to do miracles and he's going to deceive some believers. So we don't follow miracles. We follow the word of God. We follow, and God will do miracles in our lives. But we don't say, I got to see a miracle. Because if you do, the devil, you're ripe and prime for the devil to come and deceive you. Miracles are good and God calls us to do some things. But if that's why we're after, we're, we've lost it. We just need to be obedient. We need to be obedient in the small things and God will take care of the big things. Amen? So Moses and Aaron, they throw this staff down. It turns into a snake. And all of a sudden, here comes Pharaoh with his magicians and sorcerers. They threw their sticks down. I imagine there was a bunch of them. I don't think it was just two. I think it was a whole bunch. And they threw these things down and all theirs turned into snakes as well. And while that happened, what happened? I believe Moses had a king snake. Because the king snakes, they eat other snakes. This snake gobbled up and swallowed all these other snakes. <laughs> I don't know if that's how they did it, but he swallowed every one of those other snakes. Listen, what does that mean to us today? The enemy will use deception. The enemy will use lies, and he'll do everything. But God, always in the end, he swallows up the deceptions and the lies. Truth always wins. What does this mean? You follow God. There's false religions out there. There's false ideologies. There's false doctrine within the church. But in the end, the truth will come in and it's going to swallow those lies up. It will always win. Just like it's, it was always king at the beginning, it will be king at the end. Amen? So whatever religion comes out there and says, all religions lead to God, that's a lie. And let, let the snake of God swallow that up. Okay? It's a lie. It's a lie. Only Jesus is the way. And God does. It's not an arrogant thing. It's because God knows I have the cure all the others are a lie, and I don't want you to fall for that. I have the cure. So it started with one snake, <laughs> and it ended with one snake. It's going to start with the king of kings, and it's going to end with the king of kings. Amen? I want you to know that. Hallelujah. God is looking for ordinary. God is looking for the common. And God is looking for the average sticks, and he anoints them, and he uses them. Listen, it wasn't Moses who did the miracle. He just did what God told him. It wasn't Moses' uh, ability to do the supernatural. God isn't looking for our excellence or our brains. God's not looking for the American idol. God is looking for the sticks. God is looking for the sticks. Be who you are. Don't try and be like anybody else. Amen? Young person, listen to me. I know we have all different types of people that are out there that we look up to and we, we think they're awesome. And that's fine, and especially if they're godly people. Follow them. I mean, listen to them. Listen to them. But really, our focus should be, God, you've called me to be me. You've called me to be the stick that I am, and you want to use me as I am. Don't try and be like the rest of the world. Amen? Don't try and be... Can I have some parents say amen on that one? Amen. Don't try and be like the rest of the world because you will be led astray. Hallelujah. I want to read one more scripture, bringing it to a close here. This is found in 1 Corinthians, and it says this. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that a few of you weren't in the world's eyes. Okay, let me start over. I want to say this. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God talk, called you. Instead, God chose the things, say this with me, the world considered foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. He chose the things that are powerless to shame those who think they're powerful. God chose things desired, uh, despised. God chose the things that were despised by the world. Things counted as nothing at all. And he used them, hallelujah, to bring to nothing what the world considers important. And as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Listen, you don't have to be great. You're great in God's eyes. I love what was said this morning during worship. When we come to worship, we come for the audience of one. We come to worship you, God. Amen? Amen. And that's, that's what we need to do here as well. Lord, use me. I'm not looking to the world. I don't want to compare myself to the world because I know the devil will lie to me and say, you're not like this. 
You're not as pretty as that. You're not as talented as this. You're not as smart as this. You're not as strong as that. You're not as wise. You're not as wealthy. Can I give you a keep going on and on and on and on? This almost sounds like the list that Moses says. Well, I can't even speak. I can't do this. I can't do that. God says, I've chose you. And you are simple. And I want to use the simple. We don't have to be all these other things. And, and by the way, for those out, listen to me. For those who are out there who are beautiful, who are smart, and who are wise, <laughs> there are people like that out there. Uh, but for those who are out there like that, God still wants to use you. But where does it start? It starts in the heart. See, God resists the proud. So when you have those things, all of a sudden you look to yourself and you think, look at what I've done. Look at me. Look, look how I'm playing the piano. Or look how I'm uh, talking. Or look how I'm doing whatever it is that you do good. Because the devil comes in, he, he does that sort of thing. Hey, they're watching you. Oh, are they really? Oh, great. You know, you know what I'm saying? Am I being way too transparent here? Whatever it is that's going on in your life that you feel you know, you're, you're good at, the devil will use that to bring pride in your life. But you just give it to God and you just be an ordinary stick. God will use you in a powerful way, but then go back being a stick, amen? Go back to being a stick. God's going to bless your job. God's going to bless your business. God's going to bless your hands at what you do. And it's going to be a miraculous thing that's like, Lord, thank you so very much. Hallelujah. But then step back and being a stick, but don't think it's because of who I am. Look what I've done. Look what, uh, hey, you need advice from me? Yes, you need advice from me. Let me give you advice because you need advice from me. That's wrong. That's wrong. Go back to being a stick, amen? <laughs> Go back to being a stick. So we don't need to be like the rest of the world. We don't need to be proud. Be simple. Be common. Be ordinary. And let God use you in whatever situation because I want you to know this. God resists the proud, but he lifts up the humble. Amen? What was the devil's uh, falling? Pride. I will be like God. I will set on high. The middle letter of sin is I, isn't it? What's the middle letter of pride? Ooh, that one came free. P R I D. Yeah, the middle of <laughs> pride is the letter I. Hallelujah. Many times we look to invite those who think, uh, and I'll, I'll, I want to relate this one more thing, and then I'm going to close. Many times when we want to invite people to church or we think about people coming to church, we think, um, you know, boy, this person is smart. This person is wise. This person's got money. This person's got influence. This person's got talent. Man, we got to get them in church. And that's good. That's good. That's great. But if we neglect all the sticks out there, that's wrong. What it is, we're trying to surround ourselves with people better than us so we feel good about ourselves, right? Look, I'm with them. They'll just reject you and they'll kick you out of that church. <laughs> that's what will happen. Church is good to go after people like this, but if that's all our focus, I, I remember I was, where was I at? I was, uh, the Lord was just speaking this to my heart and I was, oh, I was at a tire shop and I just saw this couple that was sitting there and I thought, you know, when you look at people, you do a quick judgment of them, don't you? We do. That's just natural. And I saw them, and I, you know, I made a quick judgment of them, not in a positive way. And then instantly the Lord says, I love that person, and that person is highly esteemed to my eyes, and here you look down on them, Terry. You are wrong. I had to repent. Because I was thinking, hey, you know, you know looking around, I invite that guy to church, invite that guy, and look at them. I didn't think nothing of them other than I judged them. And the Lord says, boom, you are wrong. You are wrong. Church, we need to go after those people. Because those are the people God wants to use in a miraculous way. He wants to do a miracle in their life. Amen? He wants to do a miracle in their life. All right. What was it that we said at the very beginning? God use me. God use me. I'm an ordinary stick. Matter of fact, I'm, I live in the sticks. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. God is saying, if you want to have my hand all over your life, if you want to have my hand all over your life, be a simple stick. Hey, let me give you a quick story, and, and not with this I close. Um, I've said that, what, four times now? <laughs> there was a time when God wanted to fit, pick out the tribe, who, what tribe was going to be uh, the priest for him. And you know how he did it? He says, have everyone, have every leader of these tribes. And they, they were fighting. They were vying for it. We want to be it. We want to be it. We want to be important. We want to be important. So they went out, and God says, here's how we're going to pick it. I want you to go out. I want every one of you to go out and pick a branch off. And you come in, we're going to lay it on the Ark of the Covenant. And the next morning you're going to come back and you're going to find, uh, you're going to know which one, the ones I've chosen. 
And when they came back, they found that Aaron's rod, his stick, had not only bloomed, but it also had almonds on it. It didn't have it when they didn't have it before. It was an ordinary stick of a humble person. He wasn't vying for something great. He wasn't, God chose him because he was humble and he was simple and he was ordinary and he was common. The others were fighting and saying, use me, use me, use me, use me. And that's how they chose it. They laid them down. And what happened? Aaron's rod had blossoms and almonds overnight. And that's how God chose them. Matter of fact, there's three things in the Ark of the Covenant that God says I want you to put in there. Number one, he says, put the Ten Commandments in there. Those are my commandments. Number two, I want you to put in a a jar of manna because I want people to always remember I'm their source, I'm their supply. And the third thing was this. It was the rod of Aaron that was in there because only the humble can come close to the heart of God. Amen? The pride God resists. So let's not think highly of ourselves. Let's, let's accept who we are. <laughs> you know, can I tell you what? When I finally accepted who I was as a kid, okay, I was free. I don't, you know, I, I, I'm free. I, I, I rejoice in that. I, I remember acting cool. I remember trying to be cool and failing miserably at it, I might add. But I was terrible at it. I remember going around trying to drink with the guys in the back seat of the car, hating to taste the beer with all my heart, but yet pretending to drink and throwing out the window, full ones out the window all the time until someone caught me. He says, what was that? That sounded like a full one. And I felt like an idiot. I go, who are you trying to impress, Terry? You know what I'm saying? And I said, I'm not being like that anymore. I'm going to be a stick. (laughs) It's freeing. Uh, It's freeing. (laughs) Not a stick in the mud, but a stick. It's freeing, church. Listen. It's freeing. You don't have to be all this for God to use you. Say, Lord, use me. Say that again. God, Use me. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Hallelujah, Jesus. Kim, could you come up? Thank you. Lord, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the talents that we do have in this church. Lord, I thank you for those who use their talents, but they don't let it go to their head because they realize we are playing for an audience of one or we are praying to an audience of one or we are serving an audience of one. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you are calling the ordinary people, that you're calling the common, and you're calling the things in our lives that are simple. Hallelujah, Lord God. Here I am. Use me. Use me in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Spirit of God, just move today upon people's lives. I pray that you would be set free from the trap that the enemy has held you in for a long time. You can do all things through Christ Jesus. Matter of fact, I want you to say, as I'm praying over you right now, this week, you will no longer say, I can't do that. Uh, That's too hard. Um, I'm not smart enough in that. Stop it. What you're doing is repeating what the devil wants you to say over your own life. You are prophesying hell over your life. You're prophesying hell over your marriage. You're prophesying hell over over your children. You're prophesying hell over your job and the situation. Stop prophesying hell in Jesus' name and prophesy God. Say through Jesus Christ, I can do all things because he's called me a simple, ordinary person and my my skills are simple and ordinary and common things. I'm not standing out like the rest of the world, but in his eyes I am and I give it to him. In Jesus' name, let go of it. And God's going to do a miraculous thing. And even when you go through your desert times, God's going to bring you through that. Don't think he's left you. You just keep going after him. I want you to know this. Those who suffer with the enemy, who torment you and even bring suicidal thoughts into you, stop it. Jesus' name, I, I prophesy life over you right now. And I command that the enemy in your life just to shut up. Shut up, Satan. We renounce you and we plead the blood of Jesus upon those hearts and minds of those who are hurting and those who are suffering in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name, be set free. Hallelujah, I declare it because my God has declared it and I prophesy the word of God over you. There might be some people today who are watching over the internet 
and you're listening to this, I want you to know God knows right where you are. He knows the situation in your life and he wants to set you free right where you are. Hallelujah. You repeat what God has to say. You repeat the word of God. You prophesy the word of God over your life, over your family, over your children, and over the situation, and over the job, over your finances. I don't care. You prophesy what God has to say. And you say, Lord, I thank you that you love me. You're going to see me through this. You're a good God. You're with me in this desert. You're with me in this storm. And I'm never, you're never going to leave me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You're never going to leave me. Thank you, Jesus, for that today. In Jesus' mighty name. So be set free, church. Be set free. Go and give the truth to someone and set them free. Hallelujah. Set them free. God's going to use you. Your simple words. You say, I think it kind of goes like this. Hallelujah. Do that. And let the Spirit of God do the miracle. You handle the small things, and God will take care of the big things in your life. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah, Lord. And we thank you for this. You are a good, good Father. Amen? Amen. We love you, Lord, and we bless you. Jesus. If you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ after listening to this message, or if you have any questions concerning our ministry here at Faith Outreach Center, we would like to hear from you. Please contact us through our website at www.faithoutreach.cc or you can call us at 574-223-7631. We would be happy to assist you in any way we can. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless.